One of my favorite stories to tell people is the story of how I got into the Ace Attorney series. Phoenix Wright Ace Attorney is a series of visual novels that started all the way back in 2001. In these games, you follow the story of the titular Phoenix Wright, a rookie defense attorney fresh off the bar. While the games are visual novels primarily, they feature plenty of less passive gameplay elements, taking on the form of a whodunit type murder mystery. It's your job to collect evidence, string a case together, find the real culprit, and help Phoenix prove his client's innocent while fighting tooth and nail against cunning prosecutors intent to strike you down in court. These games, to my memory, memory at least, have always had an incredible impact upon pop culture. As far back as I can remember, they were always there. I was a kid with a lot of unsupervised internet access, and so I was on fan sites and forums way back in the early 2000s looking at early internet memes that I should not have been able to see the humor in. My earliest memory of Ace Attorney was an incredibly early version of Objection.lol, a website where you can freely mess around with the assets in the games and make your own court cases silly or serious. You'll see people doing this a lot with arguments they have in their various group chats, like this one my friend made about a full-scale war my Discord server had over the quality and taste of Lofthouse cookies. Nowadays, Objection.lol is an impressive streamlined tool, but I remember back in 2007 when only one case maker like it existed. A simple Java page only capable of generating one animation at a time and using the assets from the original Ace Attorney instead of the HD re-release. Back then it was under a completely different domain name. I've long since forgotten and all I really understood about it was that it was a reference to a video game I had no interest in. As time went on and I grew up, I continued to have no interest in Ace Attorney. All I knew of it was that it was about a blue guy and a red guy. They were in love, probably. I had a Fujoshi phase back when I was first questioning my own sexuality, but despite it, I still never latched on to the gay lawyers game. Eventually, I got to a place in life where all I really wanted to see in my media was women. Not even well-written ones, just women in general. Ace Attorney was just a blip on the radar then because and I knew this from existing around it for so long, Ace Attorney didn't feature any women. I really thought that it didn't. So how did I get into Ace Attorney? Well, like I said, it's kind of an amusing story. There's this website called Uquiz where you can make fully customizable quizzes from scratch. In recent years, uh, Tumblr and other websites have taken to making personality quizzes and they're about what you'd expect, you know, nonsensical things like which hose your song is playing as you finally descend back into the bog from whence you came, stuff like that. About two years ago, a friend of mine put one such you quiz on my dash. It was a little less obscure than the aforementioned example, titled simply, what white haired anime boy are you? And I took it because a bitch wanted to know. I don't know how everyone else does you quizzes, but I always answer honestly and I almost never retake them. I have retaken this one in the years since, just out of curiosity and amusement, but I am delighted to tell you my result has never changed. There are seven possible results for this you quiz. Kakashi, Kilua, Silver the Hedgehog, Kaworu, Kumaida, Prussia, and of course, Godot from Ace Attorney. So you can probably see where I'm going with this. I lied. I, li I lied. I lied to you. There are eight results. There are eight. Now, at this point in time, I have never seen this man in my life. But the description here, in all caps, WHAT THE FUCK IS WRONG WITH YOU?! Charmed the ever-loving shit out of me. So I googled him, and I went to his AA wiki page, and I saw too much text, and my ADHD kicked in, and I realized I didn't actually care. I then instead went to Tumblr, who are much more interesting than a wiki page, and asked them, in very clear language of course, who the fuck this guy was. The response I got was not exactly what I was expecting. Now, you quizzes are mostly meant to be fun and silly. I don't think anyone actually takes them that seriously. And while I have gotten a few you quiz results that have had me feeling incredibly known, I am no real exception to that rule. So I want to preface this by saying my Tumblr followers were just playing in the space with me. They weren't up in arms or anything. But a humble viewer, when I tell you I was flooded with asks. Tons of the people following me, to my memory close to 10 or 15 at least, had some very 
passionate opinions about this U quiz result. No one, and I mean no one, actually said a word to me about who Manfred von Karma was. No, they seemed to gloss over him entirely, ignoring the part where I asked about him. My Tumblr followers, all different people from different walks of life, most of whom did not know one another, had but one single mission. One single piece of information they needed to relay to me. Francisca. Francisca? The name escapes me. Francisca. And I thought to myself, Ace Attorney? Ace Attorney is only about the two guys, right? It's about Phoenix and his roughly boyfriend. And I guess this old vampire looking guy, but Francisca, I don't, I don't know a Francisca. Furthermore, that sounds like a woman's name. There aren't... There aren't women in Ace Attorney. Are there? I really, really like it when people compare me to fictional characters. It's a surefire way to get me into a thing you like, and it's also a declaration of love. Hi, friend of mine. I love you so much that I see you in endless places. I see you even where you are not. Here is a whole other person, but I see the creases of your smile in their own. I see your convictions and your pain when I see theirs. It's one of the most kind and loving things someone can do to me. And people do this to me a lot, you know, I'm one of them fiction kins and I have been since I was a child. So the people who love me tell me when they see me in fiction. But this was different. <laughs> this was intense. And this was numerous. I'm used to the occasional, this character reminds me of you here and there. It's normally a whisper, a giggle, a gentle thing on a sleepover movie night, murmured beneath the covers and punctuated with a slap on the arm. That was not what I received when I posted this Hugh quiz result. The crowd declaring me this Francisca individual was uproarious. They were emphatic. They were almost offended on my behalf that the first time any force compared me to an ace attorney, it was just a hair off, just a single von karma out of line. Some of them talked like it was their life's mission to right this wrong, to die at my heel while they croaked this final message out. Tumblr user Musashi. Google Francisca von Karma. And well, I was a little shocked at that. What could she possibly have in common with me that so many people felt so strongly that I needed to know? Her, of all the characters to choose. Well, I had to know. So I wound up on her wiki page, skimming the personality section as I often do to avoid spoilers in case I ever do get into the thing. I picked out some words as I skimmed. Competitive, unrelenting, cold, whip-wielding, mean. I closed the tab. I deleted every ask. And I didn't think about Francisca Von Karma for 
another two years. When those two years were up, I joined a Discord server. I was in a weird place and I really, really needed friends. At the time, I was super into The Legend of Zelda, so I joined a Zelda server and put myself out there trying to make friends with like-minded interests. I'm still in that server to this day, and I can say with full confidence, it's one of the best spaces I've ever been a part of. In the early days, it was about what you'd expect, until one day the topic of Ace Attorney came up. You see, a wonderful YouTuber called RT Game had been playing the trilogy, and he had taken a bit of a liking to Manfred von Karma. The AA fans in the server were having a laugh about it, posting clips from the playthrough, and I, seeking to make conversation despite my lack of knowledge on the topic, well, I dipped a toe in. I don't AA, but I got this guy on a white-haired anime man personality you quiz once. The description just said, what the fuck is wrong with you? In retrospect, I now know that this was probably an insane thing to say to people who knew the canon. My friends were sure to tell me of this fact, while I scrambled to explain myself. Moo, I have questions and concerns at that fact. I don't know. I'm a supervillain, maybe it got confused. Well, he did kill a man, then adopt that man's son, then tried to accuse him of murder as a final F you to the guy he killed. Did the guy deserve it? Not at all. Damn, yeah, I don't know. I expected that to be the end of it, but then, of course, like clockwork, everything circled back around. Wait Moo, you should look up Francisca Von Karma. She's white-haired guy's daughter and she's great. Francisca is great. She brings a whip to court and no one is safe. Love her and hate her. Whipped a man so hard he passed out and no one said anything. When I said I got him on the quiz everyone flooded my inbox to tell me I was her instead. Like unanimously. Multiple asks. You are 100% Francisca. This time I felt... differently. I'm not Tumblr famous. I don't think. But I do have some Tumblr clout, the most useless form of clout there is. At present, I have close to 9,000 followers, and while most of my interactions on Yield Hell site are positive, I do sometimes get caught up in some of the less pleasant bits of having some semblance of a platform. One thing I struggle with is people reducing my human complexities down to a few traits they observe, simply from my online presence. Like most people, there's a lot going on inside my heart and head, and most of it can't be summarized on my social media. Yeah even when I am oversharing nonstop on tumblr.corn. Obviously, I know they're just repeating back to me what they see, but sometimes, despite my best efforts, I get a little in my own head about it. A bunch of relative strangers assigning me a mean lady with a whip evidently hurt my feelings. And that's why I paid no mind to it, ignored it for two years, and never thought about it again. Because I am mean, and I am fierce, and I am arrogant and emotional and haughty, but don't they see I'm so many other things too? How dare they reduce me to only my thorns, armor I was forced to don and chose to keep because long after I needed it, I thought it shone ever so beautifully in the sunlight. I scorned people for only seeing me as a mean anime girl with a weapon in her hands, and I didn't give them a second thought. But now, these were not strangers, reiterating that comparison. These were my friends, people who I felt really did see me, even at this early stage of our friendship. And if they said I was Francisca, well, maybe it was worth digging a little deeper into. Maybe there was something there I wasn't seeing. As fate would have it, I didn't have to. Because only a few weeks later, the admin of the server had a question. If they streamed the Ace Attorney games, would anyone want to join them? And we could all experience the story together? I'd love to, I said, and a year and a half later, we still play them as a Saturday tradition. I lasted three months before I bought myself a bullwhip. If Ace Attorney was an ocean, it didn't just lap at my ankles. I think once upon a time, I tried to wade, but before I had time to blink, its tides had taken me, and I was thrown beneath the waves into the glittering blue world below. I wasn't expecting to get autistic about Ace Attorney at all, let alone that fast, and I certainly wasn't expecting everyone to be so right. Not only did I feel an incredible connection to Francisca Von Karma, but I felt a connection to her that outshone almost every fictional character I've ever identified with or as. I thought, this is one of the best female characters I've ever seen in any piece of media ever. And I was certain that the internet would agree. That notion was, as the legend herself would say, foolish. Phoenix Wright, I can't wait. Let's 
take it back a bit. We can't talk about Francisca von Karma without talking about the man who came before her. Manfred von Karma, for those who are unaware, was the final boss, so to speak, of the first game in the Ace Attorney trilogy. He was a terrifying prosecutor introduced in the final hour with a presence that makes the player feel as though they've lost before the cross-examination even begins. What's more, he was a literal legend, a walking god amongst prosecutors, with a 40-year win record under his belt and countless accolades to the already hefty weight of his name. I have another video where I talk in length about Manfred because he's one of my favorite characters in Ace Attorney, and if you want the full rundown on who I personally think he is, or even just the gist of his place in the story, the link to that will be in the description should you want some of my thoughts. Suffice it to say, though, Manfred is a terrifying individual who uses every means at his disposal to try and beat Phoenix into submission. His introduction to the story is not only that of the prosecutor in this final case, but also the mentor and surrogate father to Miles Edgeworth, Phoenix's good friend and courtroom rival. Manfred took Miles in when he was a young orphan, mentored him when he made the choice to become a prosecutor himself, and honed his skills in court until they stood two ruthless pillars of justice behind the bench. This final case is a tragic conclusion to that relationship that Miles and Manfred have. When the truth of it is finally revealed, we find out that Manfred did not simply take in a young orphaned Miles Edgeworth. Manfred von Karma is the very man who shot and killed Miles' father himself. Not only that, but Manfred then attempted to frame Miles himself for the murder, as well as a completely different murder he orchestrated to fall on the 15-year anniversary of the incident. Ultimately, justice is served. Phoenix wins the case in Miles' favor, and Manfred von Karma is dragged off to prison and sentenced to death row. But the conclusion of this case is, obviously, bittersweet. While Miles himself gained some closure, it comes at the price of finding out that the man who's been his rock for 15 long years was the monster hiding in the shadows all along. This, plus quite a few other factors, shake Miles to his very core and make him question everything he is and everything he knows. Phoenix, too, is haunted by this final case. Mere mention of Manfred's name gives him flashbacks. While Manfred von Karma physically exits the story, never to be seen or heard from again, his presence continues to haunt the narrative long after his death. This is driven home especially by the fact that the crime he committed 15 years ago had intense ripple effects, affecting almost every single character in this original trilogy and changing the lives of everyone it touches through chain reaction alone. Ace Attorney 2 Justice for All picks up a few months after the first game's ending. After a brief tutorial that has little bearing on the story, we're thrown into our first real case. Once more, Phoenix's best friend and legal assistant, Maya, is on trial for a murder she most certainly didn't or didn't intend to commit, and it's up to us to help Phoenix get her acquitted. This investigation on the first day putters along in a fashion perfectly typical for Ace Attorney, right up until the last few minutes at the scene. Phoenix is chatting with Dick Gumshoe about the circumstances when the detective drops an absolute bombshell. He tells Phoenix that the prosecutor on this case is Von Karma. Immediately, Phoenix locks up, his heart racing on its own before he can find his common sense. Naturally, he has questions. How could it be Von Karma? Von Karma was a ruthless murderer who stood trial and was locked up disbarred and disgraced, why would he be back in the courtroom? Gumshoe backpedals then, clarifying, no, no, it's not that Von Karma. It's his successor. This only raises further questions. Successor? He had a successor prepared. Gumshoe informs Phoenix that not only is it his successor, it's literally Manfred von Karma's child, who was born and raised in Germany and has been overseas prosecuting all this time after becoming a lawyer at the tender age of 13. They're revealed to be a prodigy with all the makings of a legend. The game is very careful here, to not drop a single pronoun or gendered term. The intended effect, of course, is to needle at the player's internalized misogyny. If you aren't familiar with the canon, you'll more than likely be picturing a young man in your head standing there on the other side of the courtroom. It isn't until you're literally in court with her that you realize Manfred's successor to the Von Karma throne is actually his youngest daughter. So, with all that set up out of the way, I can finally now talk about Francisca. When Phoenix initially enters the courtroom, he actually doesn't register that Francisca is even the prosecutor. Though she's dressed to the nines and propped up on sharpened stilettos, Phoenix sees her for what she is, a 
child. Francisca is barely 18. Her whole ensemble, an attempt to make herself look bigger that only kind of works. She attributes this hesitation to recognizing her to misogyny, questioning Phoenix on if he's surprised at her being a woman. And then, to the shock of everyone in the courtroom, Francisca pulls out a whip and declares to Phoenix her mission. Revenge. She does not elaborate further. When the judge tries to interrupt her, she whips him and lets everyone know in no uncertain terms that if they speak out of line, she'll whip them too. She proves this by whipping Phoenix mere seconds later for breathing a little too loudly. This is our first impression of Francisca. She is a domineering, confident, sharp-tongued woman who doesn't allow herself to be overshadowed or spoken over, a perfect successor to the legend who came before her. The game does its best to remind you whenever it can that she is Manfred's daughter. Sprite mirroring is a staple of showing off relationships in the Ace Attorney franchise, and Francisca's own sprites are no exception. While she doesn't resemble her father much physically, she does mirror a ton of his mannerisms, and the one one physical trait they do have in common, their eyes, is an incredibly striking choice. I've always really loved how Francisca is, all things considered, a cute young girl, but then she's just got her dad's evil stink eye always leveled at her enemies. One of the things no one talks about, though, is a very particular trait of Manfred's that carried over to Francisca. See, Manfred has this way of capturing the courtroom's attention when he's prosecuting. He snaps his fingers. Whether the peanut gallery is getting unruly or he simply feels the need to remind everyone who's in charge, the sound design on these piercing finger snaps of his is incredibly effective at striking fear into the heart of the player. This gesture represents control, evidenced by one of my favorite scenes here in the anime after Manfred's been exposed. He tries to snap his fingers like he always does, but he can't. He's lost control of the situation. The courtroom no longer bends to his will, and so the gesture fumbles and fizzles as he struggles to gain footing. Manfred's presence on its own is imposing and hulking enough that a mere snap of his digits is enough to shut you down. Francisca, though, is quite little, and as previously mentioned, is a cute young girl, not a dehydrated Dracula like her father. Father. So she brings some heavier artillery. I never ever see people point out that Francisca's whip is meant to be a parallel to her father's finger snapping, but I'm here right now, so I'll I'll, I'll, just, I'll just point I'll just point it out. Few things infuriate me more in AA spaces than the misunderstanding of the importance of Francisca's whip. More than a few times, I've seen people call it annoying or gimmicky, and well, I guess I kind of sorta understand where they're coming from. I don't think many people really know what it's meant to represent. So I'm gonna go ahead and talk about the whip in relation to Francisca for a while. Remember at the beginning of this trial when Francisca asked Phoenix if he was shocked that she was a woman? This is not just a throwaway. Line. Canon is a little subtle with this, but the shape of it is there nonetheless. Francisca is a person fighting an uphill battle against a lot of misogyny in her line of work. Not only is she a woman in a male-dominated profession, but she is a teenager as well, and anyone who's ever been a little girl will tell you how hard it is to be taken seriously by literally everyone around you. Here in case 2-2, we have her asking Phoenix this. Over in case 3-5, Francisca says this about herself, that she believes she appears weak and frail to others, that she believes when people see her, they view her as nothing more than a poor, helpless waif simply because she's young and female. And when you look at Francisca, you start to realize just how much of her is purposely created to combat this notion. Look at her design for one, the massive poofy Juliet sleeves, the signature Von Karma ruffles, the high heels. Francisca is the lawyerly equivalent of an adolescent reptile puffing out its neck frills to scare off predators. Couple that with her excessively professional fancy getup. Remember, Maya and her? are the same age, but Francisca looks years ahead. None of this is accidental. Francisca very carefully crafted this image, that of someone who is older and bigger and more competent and imposing than she may seem. But that still wasn't enough, and that's why she has the whip. No man, however condescending, can keep a straight face when they're getting lashed to hell and back. While I tend to waffle on its canonicity, this is also something that's present in her flashback case in Ace Attorney Investigations. Here we get to see her at age 13, right before she's set to pass the bar. And despite this fact, no one will take her seriously. It's all just comments about how she's a brat and a kid. And she is, but also, like, of course she's going to act out when so many people act so unbelievably condescending toward her. Bad attitude or not, Francisca's a genius who's very excited to work a crime scene and string a case together. Yet all anyone will do is make comments about her age. So... 
she beats the shit out of them, as she should. <laughs> the riding crop and whip are the only way she can manage to command attention and control the situation. By Francisca's own admission, she feels that the people around her underestimate her capabilities. Francisca's whip is not just a physical object that exists in proximity to her. It is also heavily symbolic of the control she feels she has over any given situation. It's an item of comfort she clings to, a failsafe for when she feels as though she has no control. So long as Francisca has her whip, she has her own destiny firmly within her hands. It is not just a gimmick, and it is not just for slapstick violence. It is an important metaphor that represents her as a whole. Defense, this may be a wee bit unorthodox, but I would like to offer you a suggestion. Plead self-defense. It's your only chance. A self-defense plea? Quite literally every single person in the canon of Ace Attorney, and now myself as well, understandably feel the need to compare Francisca to her father. As previously mentioned, there is a lot to compare. Francisca carries many of Manfred's mannerisms and a lot of his personality too. Coldness, callousness, haughtiness, little patience for nonsense, rigid perfectionism. I get the impression that more than a few times she and her father have walked into a room only for everyone around them to think fearfully. Holy shit, there's two of them. The similarities end though, and I wish there was more analysis on how and where and why they end. I have a lot to say on this topic, and it's analysis that has to be scattered throughout the video in order for it to make the most cohesive sense. So right now at the beginning of JFA, I want to talk about what is immediately apparent. Francisca's prosecution style. I think that it can probably be pretty easy to look at Francisca and Manfred and at surface level say their way of prosecuting is a mirror image. The both of them have a tendency to exude absolute control over their witnesses, coaching them very carefully on what to say or rather what not to say. In real life, this is actually pretty standard practice for any lawyer with a brain, but Ace Attorney tends to play up and exaggerate what corruption looks like in the courtroom, and so oftentimes the prosecution's manipulation of key evidence is something that the truth of the trial absolutely hinges on. The Von Karma style of prosecuting definitely encourages witnesses to keep details to themselves, because Phoenix has a tendency to get hung up on those details and find his client's innocence within them. On surface level, control is one once again, the name of the game. Control the witness, control the judge, control the defense. If you remain in control, the road to the perfect win is clear on the horizon. Francisca and her father both follow this principle, but there is one difference, glaring and key, that sets them apart. Simply put, Francisca fights for justice. Manfred fights to win. This may be a controversial take, and I promise by the end of this video I will prove to you that that's not so. Francisca does care about her win record. It's one of the most important things in her entire life, something she builds her whole identity upon. But she also cares about making sure that justice is served, and she cares about this in tandem with her desire to win. I find it strange that so many people, including characters in the story, seem to find these things mutually exclusive. Because we play this game through Phoenix's eyes, we're meant to scorn the prosecution. After after all, how could they fight so hard for what amounts to lies? We know Phoenix's clients are innocent. By definition, then, the prosecution fights for the deaths of these innocents, because in case it wasn't clear, almost every culprit in Ace Attorney is handed a death sentence. But in game one, this notion is challenged. Miles Edgeworth turns it on its head. He opens up about his trauma, how it fueled his desire to prosecute, because he wanted to fight for the victims, not the accused. In a very short time, the player goes from scorning the prosecution to understanding understanding that we are working together. There is one truth to every case, and trial exists so that both sides of the courtroom can uncover it together. Almost everyone I've encountered is very soft on Miles, despite some of the horrible things he did as the demon prosecutor. It's implied that he sent plenty of innocents to prison, simply because he couldn't comprehend that the court system was flawed, skewed in the prosecution's favor. But the fandom, and the canon itself, forgives Miles, even when it really doesn't have to. We understand where he was coming from in time, and we appreciate the complexities of his character because of it. I don't see Francisca given this same treatment. Yes, she is a ruthless prosecutor, but just like Miles, we are in time shown that she does this because she cares about the victims. I will speak more on this later on in the video. Right now, though, I want to circle back to Francisca's prosecution style and why everyone who says she prosecutes like her father is missing the mark. Here is the thing about Manfred von Karma's control. It is short, succinct, and leaves 
no room for argument. Honestly, this is a side note, but the choice to make this bitch German in the English localization was the most big brain shit I've ever seen because this motherfucker embodies the spirit of German communication in a way I rarely see in fiction. His opening statement is 11 words long. He cannot be bothered to call the judge by his proper title and the judge is too fucking scared to correct him. Manfred rarely asks questions, only offers commands. Testify. Tell the court about this. Tell the court about that. If they talk too long, he silences them. He speaks on their behalf. He speaks on the judge's behalf. He speaks on the defense's behalf. Manfred prides himself on short trials. Guilty verdicts in mere minutes. At the start of day two's trial, he proudly declares the verdict will be given in three minutes and then counts down the seconds himself. Manfred von Karma doesn't have time for this. Trial is a notch in his belt. We can infer that he is not here to examine the details. He is here to rack up wins. Perhaps once upon a time, he did do all this for the pursuit of justice, but many years and at least one murder later, that is not the man he is anymore. Francisca is, by all accounts, his complete opposite. In the beginning of this trial, one of the first things Francisca does is offer a plea bargain, something that to my memory has never happened in AA before this. She advises Phoenix to settle for a justified self-defense charge, a lesser sentence, but one that would still see Maya found guilty. Phoenix, of course, denies this and pushes for a full acquittal because he's Phoenix. This is a very interesting way for Francisca to start the trial. On first blush, I think anyone playing these games for the first time and anyone who doesn't give Francisca much thought might see her there in the shadow of her father and immediately jump to the conclusion that she's trying to get an easy win in a short amount of time. I, however, emphatically believe that not to be the case because, like I said, that is what Manfred would do. That is not Francisca. Pay close attention to the trial as it plays out, and you'll note that Francisca likes to play with her food. She would much rather drag a trial out, follow every branching thought, and take the opportunity to slowly crush every possibility one by one. Manfred refuses to risk a thread of truth unearthing itself. Francisca possesses none of his cowardice. She'd rather pluck those threads one by one. For example, at one point in this trial, while Lada is on the witness stand, the judge quite literally says that he is done hearing her testimony. They hit a wall, and Maya's guilt seems to be proven. And even though Phoenix has further questions and a key detail he needs to bring up, he's overruled and about to lose. Francisca doesn't let that happen, though. Despite the fact that she was mere inches from victory, she overrules the judge and demands that he let Phoenix continue. When prompted, this is what she says. Avan Karma's case is perfect. Absolutely flawless. In essence, if Francisca were to let this argument of Phoenix's go unquashed, then she wouldn't be handing down perfect justice. To her, perfect justice in a perfect case hinges on the most absolute truth being brought to light. No room for doubts, no room for unanswered questions, and no argument from the defense gone unanswered. Despite how foolishly foolish her fool of an opponent sounds as he foolishly flaps his foolish gums, Francisca will gladly sit there and hear every word simply so she can strike it down and rest well at night knowing she 100%ed her court case. No half measures, no half assing. Avon Karma does everything with their whole heart. So, Back to that justified self-defense plea. We've established that Francisca is not the type of person who wants a quick and easy win in court. So by that logic, her offering the plea deal to Phoenix had to have some other reason, one that we as observers are never told and only left to speculate upon. And because this is a video about the often unspoken deeper nuances of Francisca's character, I'm going to do just that, albeit with the help of someone else. This next part of the analysis is not my own theory crafting. I owe every word of it to my dear friend Pictures with boxes who actually likes Francisca a million times more than me. From this moment on, I am denoting her ideas and words via an overlay of her typing the trademark symbol into our Discord DM window. As you can see from my interest in lawyer-based media, I am somewhat of a lawyer myself, and thus I know extensively that this is, in fact, how copyright law works. Why did Francisca attempt the plea bargain? And what does the answer to that question tell us about her character? Well, simply put, Francisca does not think that Maya Faye should be on trial for murder. 
See, it's established in the trial that in preparation for this case, Francisca did some fairly extensive research into the Karain School of Channeling. This being the case, she should know that when a medium channels, they essentially give up their body to the spirit and blink out of existence. Ergo, despite Maya's hands allegedly being wrapped around the murder weapon, it was not actually Maya who did the killing. Laws are not described and followed to the letter in Ace Attorney. One of my favorite posts of all time that kind of shaped how I write AA fan fiction said something to the effect of, I have no idea how court works, but neither does Capcom, so it's okay. I find that to be true in many regards, but that doesn't mean that the proceedings in the series are completely divorced of their real-world inspiration. A lot of what we see in Ace Attorney is stuff you'd see and hear in an actual courtroom. I bring this up because legalese is wordy and hard to parse for a reason. Laws are described with incredible detail and meticulousness to avoid technicalities propping up and being taken advantage of. Everything in every law, if it's written up to standard, should be painstakingly defined. So, Oh, murder. Murder is a serious charge, and one we've had plenty of time to clearly define within the parameters of the penal system. One crucial part of murder in pretty much all jurisdictions is intent. In degrees one through three, there has to be intent to harm. With no intent, the correct charge is something closer to manslaughter or negligent homicide. If Maya is not in control of her own body, there is no possible way for her to have any intent to harm or kill. Francisca is a good lawyer who is clearly dedicated to due diligence, and so it's likely that she came to the conclusion that Maya should not be on trial for the crime she was charged with. That's why I personally believe she offered Phoenix the deal. It wasn't just to maintain her record, but because she too knew that if anything, Maya should be on trial for negligent homicide at most. From Francisca's perspective, a dead woman pulled that trigger. She knows she cannot prosecute the dead, but there is still justice to be served, and she wants to figure out the most perfect way to serve it. Perfect Perfect revenge means perfect justice, and there is no perfect justice in sending an innocent woman to death row. There is no perfect justice in convicting someone who did not have any agency or malice of forethought. So, compromise. Phoenix takes the plea deal, Maya and Morgan are forced to pay damages, Maya is found guilty, but allowed to walk free, and Francisca keeps her perfect record. Phoenix, stubbornly holding on to his quest for a full acquittal, ends up being the right move, because, as it turns out, there were no spirits involved to begin with and Maya's body at no point had any part in any of it. But with all the knowledge she had at the time, Francisca certainly did her best with what she was given. And as far as prosecutors go, at this point in the story, we can already say that she's one of the most thorough and cunning. Not only that, but we can see that for all the bragging she does about her perfect record, there is a part of her that wants, more than anything, for justice to be served. Hmm. One of, if not the most crucial pieces of Francisca's character seemingly comes out of nowhere, buried dead center in a case that is, in large part, scorned as skippable filler by most of the fan base. I'm here to tell you why, actually, it is exactly where it belongs, and in the process, I might even make you change your mind on that infamous case. Yes. Really. Bear with me. If you've played the second game, then you already know what scene in particular I'm talking about. But I want to talk specifically about how genius I find the presentation of it to be, for multiple reasons. This scene takes place during the second investigation of Case 2-3 Turnabout Big Top. Phoenix and Maya are at the scene of the crime following some leads that came to light, and Francisca joins them, gloating and insulting them, and generally being Francisca. Maya, an absolute legend who has no awareness nor care for appropriate things to say in any given social situation, says something that is genuinely pretty fucking horrible to Francisca. She walks right up to Francisca looks her in the eyes and says, why are you such a jackass to us? Beating us in court isn't gonna bring your dead dad back. This is the second time someone said this to Francisca. Phoenix also said this to her in the last case and Francisca ignored him because again, that's an insane thing to say. Still, she spent every other breath declaring that she will get her revenge on Phoenix Wright, and all this time he, Maya, and the player themselves, we've all seemed to come to the same conclusion, that Francisca is grieving the loss of her father, his fall to this rookie defense attorney, that Francisca wants to best write in court to avenge her father, because that, well, that's what makes the most sense. That's what the game wants you to think, right? But then, 
Francisca flips the script on everyone. My dad. You must mean the esteemed Manfred von Karma. Of course, your dad. I know you miss him. <laughs> Enough out of you. One more word and you'll get a mouthful of whip. Now, when did I ever bring up my papa's name in this or any other conversation? Confusion sweeps across the crime scene as she lets that statement hang, because if you go back and pay attention, she's right. She hasn't mentioned him at all. And when others have mentioned him, she's ignored it entirely, not giving the idea a second thought. No, she says, this has nothing to do with Manfred von Karma. Francisca's revenge is about none other than Miles Edgeworth. Because what the narrative has pushed into the background what it has refused to clue the player in on until this crucial moment, the thing that's just been lurking there and alluded to, but never outright said until now. After Manfred was put away and Miles was forced to reckon with the conclusion of that case, he disappeared without a trace. One day he was there and gone the next. To make matters worse, he left what could very well be a suicide note behind. Signed simply, Prosecutor Miles Edgeworth chooses death. Phoenix, understandably, did not take this well. He has been spending the better half of a year trying to keep Miles from his thoughts, heartbroken at the idea that his friend abandoned him, or worse, died on him. And so, shaking, he asks Francisca why she would even bring him up. This is when Francisca completely turns the tides, it recontextualizes everything in the game, and I'm obsessed with the way they do it. Because we know Francisca is Manfred's daughter, but if you're anything like me, you just kind of forgot. You forgot that Miles was taken in by Manfred. Depending on what you personally got from canon, a lot of people think that Manfred adopted Miles. Either way, Miles viewed him as a mentor, a guardian. In some regard, a second father. Francisca says, he was my brother. And the player almost feels stupid for not putting it all together themselves. Holy shit. He was her brother. Maya was not made aware of Miles's disappearance and potential suicide. Understandably, she's shocked to hear he might be dead, but Francisca refutes it immediately. No. I know he's not dead, but Phoenix Wright, whatever you did to him, ruined him. Killed the prosecutor in him and made him flee with his tail between his legs. He ran, Francisca says, but I'm going to find him and I'll drag him back kicking and screaming if I have to. Francisca dropping everything, flying to America, seeking out Phoenix and swearing on all she is to crush him, none of it had anything to do with hurt over the loss of her unremarkable criminal of a father. Everything she has done thus far, she has done in pursuit of Miles. When I think about this scene, I think about the night I first saw it. As previously mentioned, my friends and I play these games together, and I happen to record every single session we do. I always hear it echoing in my head, what one of us said in call that night. This is such yeah. a good scene. Yeah. No jokes, it's just a really good scene. It's buried in the middle of Big Top. Oh, I know, yeah. and that's why we had to play this case, it sucks, okay. Since then, I've heard this statement repeated a lot. Why the hell is this crucial moment, the one that lays out the fact that Miles and Francisca are effectively siblings shoved in the center of this case about clowns and magicians and murder at the circus? Were this scene not here, you could more or less skip case three entirely and lose nothing. Why is this here? Dear viewer, what do you mean, why is this here? It's here because Turnabout Big Top is about Miles and Francisca and Phoenix. In case you skipped this one or are someone who hasn't played the games and just likes long form videos or are like me and got plastered the night you played this case and have now blocked most of it from your memory. Who's ready for the worst case? 
I reached yeah, her. Yeah. Yeah. No. Worst case, third case syndrome. Worst case, worst case. Worst, worst case. case. <laughs> foolishly, foolish, fool. This foolishly, foolish, fool idea. Fuck you, you're so foolish. You've even made me sound like a foolhardy fool fucking chug. Chug, goddammit. Finish it. <laughs> Finish the bottle. Allow me to do a little recapping for you. Two young lovebirds live out their days alongside one another at their place of work. Though they care for each other, the love itself is simply not enough to keep tragedy from touching their lives. By no real fault of one of them, the other dies a death of sorts. Despite everything, the living one carries on, trying to find purpose after the loss. Enter the forgotten sibling of the deceased, heartbroken and furious and looking to blame someone anyone for what happened to their family, to their brother, seething with vengeance and desperate to act. Am I talking about Regina and Bat and Acro? Or am I talking about Phoenix and Miles and Francisca? These parallels are not subtle at all. Still, I rarely see them discussed amongst fans. One thing that really sticks out to me is how visibly erratic Francisca gets towards the end of this case. It's something that could be attributed to a number of factors. She might be flabbergasted by the absolutely insane factors at play in this tragedy, or she might be realizing that she's quickly veering towards a second loss at the hands of Phoenix Wright. Or if you're like me and want to hurt, she might be connecting a little too much of the truth as it's revealed to her own life. Either way, she's notably upset, enough that other people can see it. So the reveal that Miles and Francisca are siblings is in turn about Big Top. It's here for a reason. It's exactly where it's supposed to be. And it serves the purpose of not only telling us of Francisca's true motivations and revealing to us why Miles is gone, but also recontextualize the case before it too. You might see where I'm going with this because case 2-2, though I glossed over its details, is also about siblings. Specifically, reunion in turnabout is about a vengeful, bitter sister who is forced to wear the face and live in the shadow of her dead sibling. Ace Attorney loves to do this to its prosecutors. It loves to make its cases shove little bits and pieces of trauma back in their faces. Notable distractions as they are trying to do their jobs. For Miles, this is in turn about Samurai, when Cody Hackens is on the stand and Phoenix is questioning him. Though Cody doesn't seem to feel badgered by Phoenix on cross, Miles is incredibly sensitive to the fact that there's a child on the witness stand, uncharacteristically protective of Cody's feelings. This is very easy to miss or write off the first time you play Ace Attorney as Miles being difficult, but upon a second playthrough, it becomes incredibly clear what's actually happening here. Miles is projecting. He most definitely had to testify at the trial for DL6, and given what little we know about Robert Hammond, there is a non-zero probability that the defense was not kind to or gentle with a traumatized, orphaned Miles. While Game 3 isn't one I tend to think about or analyze that often, I do really like that they have Godot prosecuting a case where the murder weapon was a cup of poisoned coffee. Admittedly, that case is a bit of a blur to me, and so I haven't analyzed it to the extent that I have some others, but that is a strangely specific means, and I cannot imagine what it must have been like for him to just have to sit there and deal with that while trying to make a case. Every case Francisca prosecutes in JFA is about siblings. Specifically, every case she prosecutes is about what life is like for a person after their sibling dies, leaving them alone to grieve and desperate to pick up the pieces. And with that segue, finally, we can talk about my favorite case in the entirety of Ace Attorney. Case 2-4, Farewell My Turnabout. For reasons that will become immediately apparent, instead of singing its praises from the get-go, I'd first instead like to say aloud and up front my biggest gripe. My single note, the one thing I would change if only I had the power to change this masterpiece of a case. <sighs> Adrian and Celeste should have been sisters. Stop, lesbians, lesbians, stop! Put down your pitchforks, please. I'm one of you, I'm one of you. I come in peace, but I need to say it. 
to someone who has only played the games, this might actually be kind of a non sequitur of a change. But actually, in every single depiction of Case 2-4 outside of the game canon, Adrian and Celeste had their relationship changed to that of family. In the stage play, they were cousins, and in the anime, they were sisters. While I personally have some major problems with the farewell anime, I do think this is its saving grace, because it's correct. Adrian and Celeste should have been sisters from the start, and I think that's why these subsequent retellings of the story chose to make them family. Side note, I've seen people saying here and there that this was a case of queer censorship a la Four Kids Sailor Moon, and that they were made into family because their relationship read as too sapphic on paper, and thus it was changed. I have searched high and low for a source on this, and I cannot find one. Just a lot of children on Twitter parroting it ad nauseum. Adrian and Celeste, in the canon as is, do have an incredibly rich queer-coded relationship. It hits all the tragic lesbian tropes, but I really do not think that Ace Attorney, the game where Miles and Phoenix consistently spend every moment on the verge of shoving their tongues in each other's mouths, is the type of game to go out of its way to tone down the gay. In fact, they famously actually tried to make it really gay on, on purpose. That's, that's, you can fact check that. Anyways, back to the topic at hand. I love me some lesbians, but the retellings of Adrian and Celeste where they are family instead are a million times more thematically appropriate for the story thus far. Adrian Andrews, crawling out of the shadow of her sister who killed herself, desperate to figure out who she is without Celeste, desperate to become her own person. This time, the comparison is not subtle. Francisca is compared outright, and more than once, to Adrian within the text of the case itself. You'll notice that in this video about Francisca von Karma, the character, I have done a lot of talking about things as they exist around her rather than who she is herself. I promise that is intentional. I promise that there is a reason for all of this. If you'll bear with me here, I'd like to talk in depth about Farewell My Turnabout for a little bit longer, and then with everything out on the table, I will finally, finally dig deep into why I personally think Francisca is the greatest character in the whole franchise. You are a scoundrel! And to think that my perfect record was sullied by a man like you! That will never ever happen again, understand? This time, victory shall be mine! I swear it on the Von Karma name! Oh, she's fired up. She's usually intense, but this is different. So. Farewell my turnabout. As previously mentioned, this is my favorite case in Ace Attorney. The gist of it is this. While attending an event, as per the norm, a murder takes place. Shortly thereafter, Maya Fey is kidnapped by a hired assassin. The assassin leaves Phoenix Wright with a radio transceiver, where he makes clear his demands. Phoenix must defend the accused, a man named Matt Ongard, in court and get him a full acquittal, or Maya will be slain. This case is designed to break Phoenix. It is custom tailored to shove him down to his lowest point. Miles is gone. Francisca is hunting him for sport. His best friend and the little sister of his mentor that he swore to look after is in the hands of a deadly hitman. Worst of all, Matt on guard is guilty. One of Phoenix's most well-written character flaws is that he has an incredibly fucked up idea of what it means to be a defense attorney. His career choice came out of a desire to protect those who had no voice of their own, and it's more or less a truth that Phoenix only chooses to defend people he knows are innocent. On paper, this goal seems noble, until you think about it for more than a few minutes. The thing is, guilty people need defense attorneys too. Everyone. Everyone has the right to legal counsel. A defense attorney does not have to argue for full acquittal. Sometimes their job is to fight for a lighter sentence too. So Phoenix being a defense attorney who more or less refuses to extend that courtesy to the guilty, well, that's actually a major flaw of his, and it's one I don't often see criticized. All that to say, he is going through it here. It shakes up his worldview, breaks him apart, amplifies the trauma of the whole situation, and then, to make matters worse, Miles shows back up and acts like nothing's changed since the last time they spoke, which we will talk about. Meanwhile, on the other side of town, Francisca has her case. Because this is it. Mad on guard is guilty. Francisca 
knows he's guilty and she's got all her ducks in a line. After watching her win record get shattered after five perfect years, after losing twice to the man who ruined not only her father but her brother as well, Francisca sees this light on the horizon. The end to this miserable year is in sight. All she has to do is make it to court and she'll have cinched her victory. Court is in session. Phoenix and Pearl tremble behind the defense's bench. And Francisca is nowhere to be found. Because right before the trial was set to start, the same hitman who took Maya put a bullet in Francisca's shoulder. I, as you can probably guess, have many... <laughs> things I want to say about this moment. This is not my favorite scene in JFA, but it is in my top three. I think that really says something about the effectiveness of Ace Attorney's storytelling, because let me be clear, this scene is not shown to us. We do not see Francisca get shot. All we get is other characters telling us of it, that she's in the hospital, that it happened right outside the courthouse, etc. For this reason, I'd like to give the play-by-play -play myself. I'd like to tell you why this scene makes me fully insane. It's mid-morning, sometime before court is set to start. Francisca is Francisca. Efficient, prepared, and above all, German. So she's probably arriving a good while before the trial in question. Miles, who has miraculously come back from the dead, is there with her. We don't know why he's there with her. When he initially revealed himself, it was to both her and Phoenix at once. The first thing he did to his sister, after she'd packed up her life in pursuit of him, after she'd dealt with his abandonment, was insult her and immediately start ignoring her to talk to Phoenix. Francisca, understandably, stormed off and away from him. Now, for some reason, they are standing beside each other once more on these courthouse steps. What were they talking about? Who knows? If I were to speculate, I'd say that Francisca had no chance of letting Miles get a word in edgewise. Were they arguing? Was he making some attempt to talk it out? We don't know what this conversation contains, or how it began, but we do know how it ends. Somewhere far off and unseen, Shelley the Killer takes aim, firing his pistol once with perfect precision into Francisca's right shoulder. By the hitman's own admission, this was a gift to Phoenix. Cover fire, he calls it. Here is this legendary prosecutor with only two losses under her belt, and it would be a shame if Phoenix were to have to go up against her again. So he takes her out. But despite his profession, he's a man with integrity. So, a fairly non-fatal wound. That, I'm sure, is all it was to him. The most logical place to cram a bullet to keep her out of court for a bit. To everyone else, though. To the player. To Miles. To Francisca, most of all. There was no crueler irony. Obviously, Anyone who's played AA1 understands the storytelling choice was intentional, because Francisca cannot walk into a room without anyone and everyone seeing past her to what came before her. Francisca is not allowed to just be who she is. Her name falls after a comma. Von Karma, comma, Francisca. All anyone can say about her, all anyone will say about her, is that she is Manfred Von Karma's daughter, so she is domineering like him and sharp-witted like him, and meticulous and rigid and fierce like him. Perhaps she is corrupt like him, and evil like him, and ruthless in her pursuit of perfection like him. And even if all of that is simplifying the depth of her, what does it matter? Because now she has a bullet in her shoulder like him. And when that bullet struck his right shoulder, he bellowed a scream so haunting, so chilling, so wrong, that Miles Edgeworth heard its timber in his nightmares for 15 years straight. Miles is not a character you can separate from his trauma, his actual canonical PTSD. 
He avoids elevators, he blacks out during earthquakes, and he is a criminal lawyer who can't always stomach the sight of a gun despite this. I don't want to make this scene about him, because it shouldn't be. I just want to try and put into words something that makes me feel crazy. Miles is easily triggered. A little bit of airplane turbulence, his vision goes fuzzy. Anything and everything that might remind him of that darkened elevator 15 years prior, suffice it to say, he probably can't handle. And I think Francisca screamed. I think it fell out of her before she could stop it. I think that bullet pulled it out of her. Magnetic. I think she fell to her knees with a gut-wrenching scream, and I think she sounded like her father. And why? Why would I say that when I've just lined up how horrible it is for everyone to see him instead of her? When I've just talked about it like it's so unfair? Because, crucially, no matter how his heart may have seized at this hypothetical scream, Miles did not see Manfred von Karma. Or rather, he did, but... 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 <laughs> What I mean to say is he saw Manfred von Karma's steel blue eyes and pinched brow and tight jaw peeking up at him from behind silver sky locks. And he saw the clench of trembling fingers around what was once a perfectly pressed blouse mere seconds before. And he heard that scream fall out of the lungs of a vengeful creature whispering the name Edgeworth like a curse beneath their breath. Miles saw all of that. And he saw Manfred von Karma, a ghost of him resting there on Francisca's shoulders. But none of that actually mattered in the moment. Because Miles saw Manfred von Karma, but more than that, Miles saw Gregory Edgeworth. This moment where Francisca gets shot, forced to take on the exact same wound her father before her did. It is crucial that Miles is here, because to me, this moment is the turning point, the point of no return, the point at which Francisca becomes her own. And I think it's beautiful that this moment, which should cement her as Manfred von Karma's daughter, heavy-handed symbolism in the form of literal lead weighing her down, is the moment where she finally rests herself from the weight of his name. Because no matter what Francisca and Manfred have in common, here there is one crucial difference between them. Francisca has someone who loves her. That is simply all that is. She is Miles's only family. She is all he has left. And now she is bleeding out on the pavement, just like someone else in his life had. It doesn't matter that she is bitter and angry and hateful toward him, as she rightfully should be, I might add. It doesn't matter that she is at her nastiest, and it doesn't matter that she is spewing blood from the same wound as the wicked man before her. Because Miles sees Manfred von Karma, and he sees Gregory Edgeworth, and he sees both, and then... Then... He sees Francisca. All the best and worst of his life, it all lives on in her. And this time, despite how terrifying this must be for Miles, he has the power to act. He fights through what is most certainly a hefty trauma response. The text retelling of this event heavily, heavily implies that Miles Edgeworth bodies Francisca into his car while she kicks and screams the whole time, presumably because she is fine and Miles is a foolishly foolish fool. I'm sorry, Miles Edgeworth, is this our gunshot wound? He drags her, drags her to the hospital, and she, of course, survives with little more than a scar in time. And most importantly of all, in surgery, they removed the bullet from her shoulder. Manfred von Karma kept the bullet in his shoulder for 15 years. It was a physical burden, an everyday reminder of the horrible, disgusting, wretched thing he had done. His cowardice to face his actions and his intent to do everything perfectly and on his own to be feared by all and loved by few means that bullet stayed exactly where it was. He was a man too fearful to even let a doctor pull it from him, lest he make a witness and spell his own end. And Miles Edgeworth, age nine, 
scared and breathless and sobbing and brave, sent that bullet careening into Manfred's shoulder. And Miles Edgeworth, age 25, scared and breathless and sobbing and brave, picked his bleeding sister up and pulled a bullet from hers. In a way, that bullet was a tangible piece of the God of Prosecutor's legacy. And it passed not into, but through Francisca. As she's going into surgery, Miles takes the case for her, just as clueless for a good chunk of it as to what Phoenix is going through on the other side of the courtroom. These two days of trial eventually end up amounting to a pure filibuster. The situation, of course, is that Phoenix is literally living through a trolley problem. If he saves Maya's life, an innocent person will be sent to jail and executed for a crime we know she did not commit. But if Phoenix fights for the truth to convict the person he knows did the crime, then the person in this world most dear to him will die. So in the background, Gumshoe, fired from the police force and acting on his own, is hot on the heels of the assassin, intent to track him down and free Maya by brute force if he has to. The name of the game then becomes to stall the trial for as long as possible, with Phoenix and Miles talking each other in circles until the detective can come through for them. Overzealous, though, Gumshoe tears through the streets of LA, running every red light and ignoring every stop sign, rocketing around on sheer determination and stupidity alone. Naturally, he eventually crashes his car, and to rub salt in the wound, it's right after he managed to get some crucial evidence from the killer that might be their saving grace in court. Gumshoe didn't share his coordinates, though, only speaking with the present attorneys through Phoenix's shitty little Nokia. They quite literally hear him crash, and then the line goes dead. They're left with nothing but the vague memory of what that glimmer of hope looked like as it quickly passed them by. Meanwhile, the stakes are higher than ever, as Maya's been starved and deprived of food and water for over 24 hours now and is barely scraping by. It's only then when Phoenix realizes Francisca had, hilariously enough, planted a tracking device on Gumshoe. When this is initially brought up, it reads like a horrible joke. She literally bugged this man just so she could keep a close eye on him because he has a tendency to leak information to the defense when he's left to his own devices. It's meant to make us feel even more wary of Francisca because, well, that that's an insane fucking thing to do. Now, though, it's their saving grace. Miles calls Francisca. Francisca bolts out of her hospital bed and makes a beeline to where Gumshoe crashed peeling the evidence off his person and, thankfully, I presume, having enough of a heart to call him an ambulance. Back at trial, the minutes tick down. Only precious seconds remain. Miles and Phoenix have run out of circles to run in, and the judge is demanding that Phoenix declare his plea to the court. The player at this juncture is given the choice themselves. We are allowed to select guilty or not guilty, and we are forced to do this knowing like Phoenix, that no matter what answer we choose, someone innocent will be sent to their death. So you pick one. Maybe you flip a coin. Maybe you close your eyes and press buttons at random. Maybe you don't struggle at all. This choice, though, doesn't matter in the end. Because before Phoenix can even get the words out, the courtroom doors are thrown open, and in steps Francisca von Karma, her single, uninjured arm full of what eventually amounts to decisive evidence. Just in case you're wondering, for a gunshot wound to the shoulder, the average person would probably be looking at three to five days in the hospital for surgery, recovery, blood transfusions if needed, initial physical therapy assessment, and pain control. Uh, two to three months to full recovery <laughs> with physical and occupational therapy. Even someone very diligent about getting out of the hospital uh, might be able to do it in two days and get back to work at a desk job in about 10 days, but it would still be a couple months to full recovery. And even Manfred von Karma had to disappear for six months without medical intervention, just in case someone caught in their sights the slight tremble of his arm when he returned. But, as previously established, Francisca von Karma is fucking built different. Reckless and tenacious, and driven by so much more than spite and the need to win, Francisca fights and fights and fights, and she does not give in. The rest of the trial plays out. Matt on guard is declared guilty. Now, in case you haven't been keeping up, the Von Karma Disciples are not the only characters in this series who had these long-standing perfect records. Phoenix 
had one too. From the moment he passed the bar until now, Phoenix has never lost a case. Once again, I love how the anime does this moment. But remember, this was supposed to be Francisca's case. Moreover, this was supposed to be Francisca's win. This was supposed to be her moment of victory, the moment she finally, finally bested him. Because she knew, and now we all know as well, that Matt Ongard was guilty of murder. Not only was Francisca going to best the man who bested her father and Miles, but Francisca was going to be the one to shatter Phoenix's perfect win record. Karma, as it were. So here we are. No, Francisca did not get to be the one standing opposite of him in the courtroom. She did not get to prosecute him into a pile of mere ash. But she got this sliver of what could have been. She got to be the cinching factor, the decisive evidence that locked Ungard away, that guaranteed Wright's loss. This is not the moment she dreamed it to be, but it is her moment, nonetheless. And so, bundled in Gumshoe's jacket with her arms still in its sling, Francisca trains her eyes across the courtroom to watch the foolish, beaten, wounded look on Phoenix Wright's foolish, fool face as he finally, finally understands what it feels like to lose. To have everything he worked so hard for crumble to nothing in front of him. And... Like I said, I am, to this day, astounded at how well the anime did this. That they even had the mind to show it at all. The way Francisca tenses, not understanding what she's seeing. The way Miles looks to her, wordlessly. Because while he was off on his own, he came to understand the truth Francisca has yet to. That in every courtroom war, there is so much more than just who wins and who loses. Francisca isn't ready, though. She simply isn't at a place where she can come to that revelation. And so she storms off, disowning Miles and herself from the Von Karma name. Two failures who couldn't live up to anything they were supposed to. And crucially, she throws her whip on the floor. Miles lets her go. Until a few hours later at dinner, when the tracking device he'd nicked off Francisca goes off, pinging him to the international airport where Francisca's about to flee, hop on a plane back to Germany, and leave all her failures in America behind. There at the gate, he finds her, and we enter my favorite scene in the whole Ace Attorney canon. Hey Nick, I heard something interesting about the Von Karma girl. Hmm? Apparently we're both around the same age. You know that? Nope, that is news to me. Isn't it remarkable? And I can't believe she went to America to make a name for herself. Yeah, it takes a special type of person to pull that off. At this point, I would like to say what I've been holding back from saying this whole time. I would like to give you the layout of the unseen truth of Francisca von Karma's life. The details she refuses to let anyone examine with a fine tooth comb. What lies beneath the facade of control and composure she wears like armor. I will tell you about what happens at the airport. Yes, but before I do that, I need to lay out her whole life for you. So let's go back. Francisca von Karma lives in her giant house with her papa. It's big. So big, and there never seems to be quite enough to fill it. Allegedly, Manfred has a wife and another older kid, but we see neither hide nor hair of them, and if you're like me, you might be of the interpretation that they are out of the picture pretty early in Francisca's life. It's just her. Her and her papa and their servants and their big, big house. It's great, if not a little lonely sometimes. And then, one day, there is Miles Edgeworth. Now, I want to make it clear, I know that nothing in the canon ever says that Miles lived with the Von Karmas, but given that it's a much more interesting story to me, and the fact that the anime, which Takumi helped direct, says it outright, it is the interpretation I personally like to follow. So that's the angle I'm coming from here. Francisca Von Karma was a toddler when Miles entered her life. This means that 
precocious though she was, she probably doesn't remember a life without him. And when I picture Miles at this age, I picture a boy with his eyes dark and downcast, always looking a little waterlogged, voice never above a whisper. I picture a boy who is grieving and traumatized, because that's what we know Miles to be as an adult. Imagine how he was when the wound was fresh. And it is here, right now, that I will propose to the court the key trait that makes Francisca von Karma who she is. If you were to take Francisca and shave her down to one thing, if you peeled away the layers upon layers that collected over the years, once she chose to coat her essence in and once she was forced to, if you simply dug deep down to the center of her heart and mined from its depths one single untumbled jewel, what you would find is protection. Francisca is protective. She loves, and she cares, and she has a desire to protect. Francisco wants to protect the people she loves, and even the people she does not love. Miles Edgeworth stumbles into her life. One day, after a long, long time away, her papa finally comes home, and this time he has brought her a brother. A brother who is soft-spoken and shy and watery-eyed and reclusive, and Francisca, little though she is, understands. Something has spooked you, she thinks. I'll make sure nothing ever hurts you again. And she takes his hand and does not let go. One of the most distinct things about the relationship between Francisca and Miles is the fact that Francisca, despite being seven years younger, staunchly insists that Miles is her younger brother. There are plenty of cute, funny, and wholesome interpretations of why she does this. Some propose that it's because she was a Von Karma before him, existing under her father's roof before Miles ever came by. Some people propose that it's a way to declare him her subordinate. After all, Francisca's got a pretty big head and a deep sibling rivalry with him. Personally, I think it's a little more simple than that. Miles' presence is just small. When they meet, I envision him small and scared, and it is the job of a big sister to look after the little ones who look up to them. Francisca certainly believes Miles can look up to her. After all, he's got a lot to learn about being a Von Karma, and who better to teach him than an expert? Does Miles ever tell Francisca about his trauma? I don't think he spells it out outright. For one, we know that Miles considers DL6 to be a curse of sorts, even going so far as to withhold critical information about it from his literal defense attorney while he's being detained. But I think if he told anyone, he probably told Francisca. Maybe just that something really bad happened to him before he came to live with her, and that something he can never get back was taken. And I don't think Francisca was necessarily born with this drive to be a prosecutor. I think she saw her brother holding back tears in his bedroom room one night, talking about how the criminal that ruined his life walked free, and clenched her fists and knit her brow and swore that as long as she walked the earth, no one like the man suspected of killing Miles' father would ever, ever walk free again. In time, we know that Miles began to feel that way too, and I always see people talk about this part of Miles in relation to his career, that he became a prosecutor because he saw himself in the victims of the violence that men do, and he wanted to act, to do something about it. I don't ever hear anyone entertain the possibility that Francisca too might see people she loves people like Miles, who are small and scared and need someone to shelter them, to lash away the evildoers. So she comes into this purpose, this dream she has of being a lawyer. In time, Miles comes into it too. In the interim, we don't know what happens. Some people believe that Manfred purposefully drove a wedge in between them, encouraged them to compete to an unhealthy degree so that they would not find strength in their love for each other. Others, like me, simply think that wedge formed on its own, not at all helped by his high standards for the both of them that they were determined to meet. Whatever the case, Miles and Francisca drifted apart, and then one day there was a literal ocean in between them, casting them apart. Francisca, by her own account, felt that Miles abandoned her, that they were side by side, fighting for footing together, and then one day he sped ahead and never looked back. We don't get to see Francisca react to Miles' eventual arrest, and we don't know what her thoughts on the matter are. Personally, the idea I've stuck with is that Miles didn't tell her and that word didn't make it to her, because I refuse to believe she wouldn't have flown to America herself to watch everything play out, torn in half, between her love for her father and her love for her brother. No, I think Francisca knew nothing of it until she got the call from Miles 
acquitted. And I think that Miles said to Francisca, that horrible thing that happened to me when I was little, it's been solved. That killer who got off scot-free all those years ago, he was a patsy, and the real killer's been found. I finally know what happened. And despite that ocean churning between the two of them, despite the years of bitterness and resentment, the things left unsaid, the big sister in Francisca's heart woke back up. In my mind, I think she got up out of her chair, pacing around the room as she talked to Miles, demanding the name, of course, the name of the monster who ruined her little brother's life, the name of the beast of a human who lurked in the shadows of this sweet boy's nightmares. I think she wanted their name and their holding cell, and I think she wanted their throat-pointed skyward and primed for her fangs. And, of course, Miles gave her their name. Where do you go after that? What do you do, knowing the man you shaped your whole world after, the man who carried you from the cradle and protected you, used those same hands to kill? Not only to kill, but to kill in such a tangible way, to kill so close to home that every day, every night, you heard the sobbing of a little boy haunted by the terrors he saw behind his eyelids, the terrors your father put there. What did Francisca do? What could Francisca do? We don't know. All we know is that somehow, despite the pain, she carried on knowing that Manfred von Karma, a man I personally believe she loved more than nearly anything, was a monster. And then, mere months later, her father was dead. Manfred was not on death row for long, at least not compared to other characters like Morgan and Dahlia. We're never told why. I think he killed himself. I don't think the man obsessed with control and power, with dignity and status, would sink so low as to let the state put him down. No, I think he did it himself while he awaited his sentence to be carried out. And I am not a nice person, so I think he did it mere weeks before Miles disappeared. And then, alone in Germany, there was one. I want to talk about Prosecutor Miles Edgeworth and how he chose death. Namely, I want to talk about how little he is held accountable by both the narrative and the fandom for doing this. When it comes to the Ace Attorney fandom, I notice that people rarely ever talk about this as the horrible, disgusting, traumatic thing it is for Miles to do to his loved ones. I think it speaks to a greater problem the Ace Attorney fandom has with projecting onto Miles so thoroughly that they forget to hold him accountable and examine the nuance in his character. I talked about this in my last video, but I think Miles is a fave for the traumatized or otherwise neurodivergent crowd, and a lot of people who suffer from suicidal ideation probably latched onto him, his canon PTSD, and his guilt complex long before he chose death. And I think for that reason he is really hard to hold accountable for his wrongdoings, especially the ones he does out of a place of trauma. From my observation, it seems that a lot of people in the AA fanbase are young and too... what's the graceful word to use here? Hurt? They're too hurt themselves to want to think about the fact that wrongdoings done out of trauma are still wrongdoings. Now, I will say that I personally think it's more likely that Miles' choosing death in JFA was meant in the original concept to be something called johatsu, a Japanese concept of disappearing or evaporating persons who leave their former lives without a trace due to a number of cultural factors. But that doesn't change the fact that it works as a very heavy suicide allegory. And in that regard, it is a bit of wish fulfillment for the suicidally idealized crowd. I think that everyone who suffers from suicidal ideation dreams of getting to watch like a ghost at the aftermath of their death, watching people mourn them and watching people finally, finally care. And I think that is in large part why people do not ever really talk about how cruel and fucked up what Miles did is, because many of them are living a fantasy through him, a fantasy where they die or disappeared and they are mourned and missed and wanted. Speaking as someone who has experienced this myself, I get it. But in reality, 
that is not how suicide works at all. Your loved ones will not all sit in a circle and excuse you of yourself because they miss you so bad and you were in so much pain. In reality, they will be thrust into a whirlwind of complex and tangled emotions as they struggle to process the loss of you. It is not pretty. Being suicidal and in that much pain is a horrible thing to go through and it is also a horrible thing to do to people. And these concepts coexist. I have attempted more times than I can count. I have also been close to people who attempted. Some survived, some did not. That doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things though. What matters is that my response every time was anger. So much so that I could not be there for my friends who survived theirs because I was so furious that they would do something like that to me that I knew being around them would only make the situation worse. I've had to say, I'm sorry you're going through this horrible thing, but I cannot face it right now. Do you have people who can help you through it? Because I cannot be one of those people. Suicide is not a cleanse. It is not a button you can press to make all the pain stop and make everyone suddenly care. The only way you can do that is with courage, perseverance, patience, and yes, a little bit of luck. It sucks and it's worth it, but that's not what I came here to say. I came here to talk about Miles Edgeworth, I think, and how it is whack to me that people defend what he did. It is a miracle that Phoenix and Francisca forgave him. As I am now, I don't think I would have. I want to stress, if you're not someone who pays attention to the Ace Attorney timeline, how close together all of these events in Francisca's life are. In December of 2016, her father is arrested on multiple murder charges. Her brother disappears not three months later, leaving her with nothing but a note and a shattered heart. Francisca von Karma had everything taken from her in the span of three months. And I'd like to remind everyone, at the time of all this happening, she was only 18. Yet still, she remained strong, not a single waver in her steely composure. When we see her in that following summer of 2017, her chin is pointed high, her back straight, her head up. Francisca seems utterly unbothered, and upon first glance, it's so incredibly easy to think that she, despite everything, is okay. Things only get worse for her as time goes on. Her win record is destroyed. When her brother comes back, he barely casts her a second glance, lording his own perceived enlightenment over her and acting as though he was in any way in the right to vanish. A deadly gunman puts a bullet in her shoulder and leaves her with a wound that troubles her even years later. And when she finally gets a taste of what it's like to beat the man who she attributes all of this to, he doesn't even have the decency to be downtrodden about it. Here, at the end of things, what does Francisca have left? Her record is gone. Her right to the Von Karma name is gone. Her whip is gone. She has no control over who she's meant to be, who she wants to be. Every hardship she's endured, she's endured with tenacity and resolve, kept her heart steady and her mind sharp, not so much as a waver in her form, not a single tear shed or a moment of weakness. Here, at the end of things, what does Francisca have left? Everything she had control over, she threw away or lost. But, of course, Francisca does not control Miles. This post credit scene is my favorite scene in the whole Ace Attorney canon. Francisca, after the case, accidentally made off with Gumshoe's coat, tracking device intact. Miles, with the tracker, catches up with her right as she's about to board her flight. Seething and lost, Francisca miraculously stops to hear what he has to say, and Miles asks her if she's running away. Understandably, she snaps at him, and this this is the first time in the whole canon we ever see Francisca be visibly upset and vulnerable with anyone, or at the very least, the first time we see her speak to her own feelings. Much like I've been doing this whole video, nearly everything we know about Francisca we know simply because other characters tell it to us. This is the first time she lets the player, a fly on the wall, into her own head 
And she says to Miles, do you have any idea what my life is like? Do you have any idea what it is like to only be known for what came before you? To be born with the weight of expectation on your name? Of course you don't, Miles, because you get all the glory of the Von Karma name without the cinder block of it tied to your ankles as you struggle to breach the water's surface. The Von Karma name is like a finely tailored garment to you. You can wear it when you need it and pin it up on your wall when you outgrow its shape. But I cannot do that. And then Francisca, who is a child prodigy, who passed the bar when she was 13, the youngest any lawyer in the AA canon has ever been, says, My father was a genius, but I have always known that I am not. This single line tells us, without saying much more than that, how blind she is to her own greatness. Francisca tells Miles she hates him, that she has always hated him, that all he has ever done is abandon her, that he abandoned her in Germany, that he abandoned her after her father died. Miles has never given her a second thought. This time, though, she runs first. She's thrown her whip away. She's given up on being a prosecutor. She's given up on being a Von Karma. He cannot abandon her anymore in any way that matters. Miles of course, brought her whip. He hands it back to her and says something that I will honestly never stop thinking about. Today, you chased after me, after I'd left you behind all these years. And that's why we're standing here now, side by side. Miles validates her. Despite how unwilling he's been thus far to acknowledge any of the bad he's done to his loved ones, Miles says, in few words, I did leave you behind, didn't I? Thank goodness you are who you are, Francisca. Thank goodness you couldn't just let me go. He says to her, in his own sort of way, despite all that's happened, I remain a prosecutor, and I intend to prosecute my own way, the way that I came into when I too had fallen to my lowest. I cannot decide for you what you should do. I will not be like everyone else. But if you choose to forfeit this rivalry of ours, this competition we've been running since time immemorial, I cannot quit with you, Francisca. I will keep charging forward and fighting for the truth. Don't you want to come along with me? And Francisca breaks down crying. She shatters unapologetically. This facade, it crumbles into nothing because Francisca von Karma all this time, she has been a glacier. Every world-shattering note of her life, every turbulent wave against her, it snakes these cracks up the side of glittering, perfect ice, and they build and they build and they never break until they do, until the cracks become too much and the structure cannot hold and the sheets of ice dislodge and cascade catastrophically into the ocean. There in the airport, Francisca falls apart. Ace Attorney does this thing where it has these hidden or one-time sprites. Basically, they are sprites that only show up during one key moment in the canon. Sometimes they are used for humor, other times, they're used to really hammer home a scene's emotions as significant and unique. This sprite of Francisca crying is one such instance, only used in this scene and never again. I think that, by far, it is the most effective and most important use of this storytelling device in the whole canon. The angry or mean character is actually deeply emotional and using anger to keep it at bay is an incredibly common character archetype, but it is so often done in a more shallow manner. Like, they'll just bust out their tragic backstory in the 11th hour and we're supposed to sympathize because, aw, they're sad. But we already know everything there is to know about Francisca pretty much immediately. We know she's a child prodigy. We know she's a genius. We know she's fierce and dedicated and that she loves what she does. And we know that she's lost her father and we know that she's upset with her brother and wants to see him again. But she does not invite pity because she does not want it. She lays these details out clearly and concisely when they're relevant to what is being discussed. They simply are. She remains as she is, and she fights the same way she always has for what she believes in. 
Francisca goes through it. We watch her go through it. We watch her lose everything. And then we watch her have to be confronted with the fact that her brother disappeared on her and is utterly remorseless about it for the most part. And then we watch her get shot and kick and scream and fight while she's bleeding out because she wants to go to court. She has to be dragged to the hospital by force. Never once does she back down? And never once does she present anything other than the steely determination and resolve until the very, very end. Until post credits. She doesn't even crack until after the credits have rolled. And this is most important of all to me. It is kindness that breaks her. It is softness that makes her cry. I feel like to a lot of people, what Miles says to her in this final scene might seem cruel, but it isn't about what he says, it's about what he does. By Francisca's own admission, she has abandonment issues. One of the few single insights we get into her pain is that people tend to discard her and make her feel left behind. When he chose death, Miles decided without the consent of the people who love him that he was not worth it. He was unbelievably selfish to disappear the way he did, blinded by this idea that he is not loved or worth love. Francisca loves him more than anything, and he did that to her on the tail end of her father's incarceration. She lost both of her favorite people in the span of a few months. Here in the endgame, she intended to give up on everything, and she ran from Miles because, again, if she abandons him first, he cannot abandon her. But nothing Miles says in that scene undermines the fact that he chased after her. He could look her in the eyes and tell her she was scum to him, but the fact of the matter is he followed her. He loved her enough to not be content just letting her give up and run away. He chased after her. Can you imagine what that must have meant to her? He didn't have to chase her, and he didn't have to bring her whip back. And when he said, if you stop being a prosecutor, this is where we part ways, I think we all knew he wasn't being literal. I think we all knew he was full of shit. I think what Miles meant by that is exactly what I said. To light a fire beneath her. To say that he had no intention of stopping, that he would keep on fighting, and that he wanted her to fight alongside him. They've always been rivals, and they've always pushed each other to do better and be better. And Miles knows that rivalry drives Francisca unlike anything else. She doesn't actually want to stop prosecuting. She's just emotionally vulnerable and struggling to cope and throwing a bit of a tantrum about it. And so he pokes at an old button he knows will clear her head. Francisca is a difficult person, but Miles Edgeworth knows her more than any person in the world. He knows how to love her, and he does. He loves her so much. She has been in so much pain. She has seen a lot of wicked words thrown her way, a lot of pushback, a lot of antagonism and banter and bickering, but the one thing no one shows her is kindness and love. Phoenix tries when he brings her flowers in the hospital, but he gets nervous and backs out at the last second. Gumshoe tries, but he does it out of earshot where she can't hear. Every nice thing someone says about Francisca, they say while well, she's not there to listen. Miles is the only person who looks her in the face and says he loves her. It is love that allows her the space to fall to pieces. It is love that shatters her veneer and turns her into a sobbing mess. She's literally just a little girl who was forced to grow up too fast. She's 18 years old and everything's so hard. She just needed a fucking hug. Francisca, as previously mentioned, will indeed never be her father. She has loved far too much and far too deeply to ever fall so far from grace. My name, Francisca Von Karma. Uh, really? Like the legendary prosecutor? That Von Karma? Legendary describes the past, but I am bringing us into the future. <laughs> When we next see Francisca, it's at the tail end of game three. Phoenix is in the hospital and Miles is, despite his protests, defending in his place. Hoping to keep his identity a secret, they arrange for a judge who won't recognize Miles as a prosecutor. But 
also needing a proper prosecutor who won't make a fuss, Miles asks Francisca for a favor. They are siblings. So when Miles calls her like, hey, can you fly out to America and pretend you don't know me so we can do a favor for this guy I've had a crush on for 15 years? Francisca's like, that sounds hilarious, of course. A little under a year has passed since the end of JFA. Francisca has notably changed, although she keeps a lot of the characteristics that endear me to her. Her short fuse, her ego, her flair for the performance of it all. This trial is important, and because of that, I want to save it for last and instead talk about the other things I love regarding Francisca here in the final case of the trilogy. First and foremost, I want to talk about what I have avoided talking about thus far. My favorite underrated relationship in all of AA, one that I and a few scattered others in the fandom have christened worsties in law. This, of course, refers to Francisca's strange pseudo friendship with Phoenix. Hearing this, you might be a little confused, especially if you haven't really thought about the two of them much, or if you skipped out on this last game. But Phoenix and Francisca do have more to them than just initial courtroom enemies, and if you dig a little deeper, I think it becomes abundantly clear. There are hints and whispers toward it in JFA, but it's front and center here in TNT in a way that I love a lot. One thing AA does really well is setting up parallels and narrative foils. For instance, we know that Phoenix is the foil to Miles. Phoenix is bright-eyed, determined, open-hearted, and a bit of a mess of a man. Miles is aloof, anxious, reserved, and suspicious, and incredibly elegant and well put together, at least in court. A lot of people stop there, but don't realize that everyone around them are parallels and foils of their own. Like Mia, for instance, Phoenix's mentor in life and in law. Her direct parallel is Manfred, who is the same thing to Miles. Mia has a younger sister, Maya, who Phoenix forges a deep friendship with and more or less takes in as family of his own. Opposite to Maya is Francisca, Manfred's daughter, who is similarly precious to Miles. On each side of the courtroom, the dynamics are the same around our two leads. And so when you think of one relationship, if you're aware of that, you'll intuitively start to wonder about its counterpart. One underdeveloped relationship in AA that I see a lot of fan works of is this relationship between Maya and Miles. For one, they have a common interest, tokusatsu shows. Specifically, they're both super into Steel Samurai, a toku show that's consistently brought up and referenced in AA. You'll see a lot of fan art of them marathoning Steel Samurai and crying over it or attending conventions together or overall just being absolutely absolute fan dorks together, but beyond the more frivolous aspect of their potential friendship, Maya was profoundly affected by the DL6 incident. It's the reason her mother and eventually her sister both left their village, and it changed Maya just about as irreparably as it did Miles. Many fan works explore them untangling this together, as even though everyone in AA was affected by DL6, Maya is one of the only people who is really on the same level as Miles in just how traumatic it wound up being on her. The inverse to Maya and Miles is, of course, the lesser appreciated Francisca and Phoenix. And it's like, why? What the fuck do they have in common? Well, nothing. Except Miles. They both just love the shit out of Miles Edgeworth, and conversely, he has done a lot of damage to the both of them, too. This, to me, is the tragedy of JFA and Francisca's ruthless pursuit of revenge. She spends the whole game trying to crush Phoenix, but what she refuses to open her eyes to? Phoenix is the only person in the whole world who understands what she's going through. And the thing is, he tries. I think Phoenix knew they were always meant to be friends. While he isn't exactly nice to Francisca, he is abundantly aware of the fact that she is a teenager going through something traumatic. He just knows that he is not the person who's going to be there for her and get her through it. But when she gets shot, he goes to visit her in the hospital despite everything. And, and I think about this nonstop, he brought her flowers. Phoenix Wright went to a florist, or even just a fucking Trader Joe's, and spent real money on flowers to bring to the nasty, venomous young girl who's been working her ass off to make his life hell. Now, in Game 3, things have had time to settle. In the beginning, Miles is off on his own, but this time, the people who love him know where he is and know he's not going to disappear on them anytime soon. Francisca and Phoenix have both had time to heal a bit, and when they meet up again, Francisca is still Francisca, but every lash of her whip comes with a 
playful smile, and perhaps her aim is just a little less deadly than before. Phoenix, like Francisca, has a penchant for leaving the hospital when he should not. So even though he's still running an insane fever, he hauls his ass up a mountain to investigate for trial the next day. Francisca declares she will accompany him, and then we get my favorite investigation segment in the whole series. Francisca and Phoenix meander around the crime scene, sharing jokes and quips with one another. One thing a lot of people get wrong in their characterization about Phoenix Wright is that he's a bitch. He's a hater and a cunt. He is sarcastic, pretentious, and incredibly judgy. He'll be the first one to use his abandoned art major to critique the color choices on a painting hanging in some random office, and sometimes when he's bored or annoyed, he'll just start reciting poetry in his head. He has a sarcastic comment for everything. I love this about him, and I always hate when I see him declawed, when I see this part of him ignored or unmentioned. It's not that he's cynical. He is an incredible optimist whose key character trait is his faith in other people, and he loves with his whole heart. But he will grit his teeth and complain the whole time if the pursuit of that faith takes him to annoying places, and it very often does. Francisca especially brings this out of him. The two of them bicker like they've known each other their whole lives. It really is just the epitome of mean lesbian and her pathetic bisexual best friend. In this investigation, it's made especially hilarious because the writers really just upped Francisca's silliness. I feel like a lot of these lines she has zero in on the foreigner aspect, and it's genuinely so fucking funny to hear someone who got like a 400 on their bar exam sit there and talk about how Americans use gravy when they run out of paint. One of my favorite parts of the whole investigation is here when Gumshoe tells them not to go into the garden because it's off limits, and then he walks away, and Francisca's like, so they're going into the garden, yeah? And Phoenix is immediately like, yeah, absolutely. There's also this part where Phoenix calls her by her full name, something Francisca does to everyone, and of course she calls him out on it and tells him how impertinent it is. Just hysterical all around. A very crucial moment in this investigation comes when they manage to find Pearl, who has been missing for a whole night. And Francisca, remember, is protective. Francisca especially is protective of little girls. We see this in turn about reminiscence when she comforts a grieving Kay Faraday, and we see it here when she rushes forward to try and do the same for Pearl. The response she gets is not what she's expecting, though. Pearl actively shuns the attempted comfort, instantly turning her claws on Francisca, because Pearl only remembers Francisca as the prosecutor who tried to get Maya thrown in prison. And she's a child, so she's not nice about it either. Pearl goes for Fran's throat. Francisca does not take this well, because as I've laid out, every single thing Pearl says here is true. Francisca is forced to confront the fact that, despite how badly she wants these victims to see her as this knightly hero of justice, there are going to be people who only ever see her as mean. But the most important scene of this investigation to me happens towards its end. Phoenix and Francisca are talking to one of the witnesses, and right in the middle of it, there's an earthquake on the mountain. It rumbles through the temple that they're all resting in. And I do want to make sure to say up front, the first thing Phoenix does is worry about Maya, who at this point is thought to be trapped in the feeble inner temple, which is prone to cavens. I'd be remiss if I didn't clarify that she is the first thing on his mind. But as the aftershocks subside, Phoenix locks eyes with Francisca. The two of them do not say a word to one another. They do not have to. Finally, Francisca breaks the silence. Are you worried about Miles? And we come back around. That's it. That's the natural heart of their friendship. The tragedy, again, of Phoenix and Francisca in JFA is that they should have been each other's solace. They should have been there for one another. They were both hurting from the same pain, and they were the only people in the world who had the capability to understand what the other was going through. But they chose to fight instead. More so on Francisca's part, she was not ready to be friends with Phoenix in the wake of all she was going through. There is no universe where they spent JFA being for each other what they needed to be. But this moment in Bridge solidifies it, because Francisco looks into Phoenix's eyes at his terrified resolve, and she realizes that someone loves Miles as much as she does. She realizes there are people other than her in Miles's life, and in a way, she realizes that is not a bad thing, that there are people looking out for him even when she cannot. She accepts that she cannot. Someone loves Miles enough to feel the earth shift underfoot 
and think of him before they think of much else, just like her. And she and Phoenix go. And Phoenix sits with her brother and keeps him steady while he beats himself up for the things he cannot help. And Francisca goes her own way and does all she can to save Maya. Because she is good. And she is protective. And she is kind. And she is named Karma. Plenty of folks talk about Francisca's role in solving this case. Much like in JFA, she works in the background, diligently so, to free Maya from where she's chained. It didn't end up being Maya in there, of course, but who it was doesn't really matter in the end. The fact of the matter is that Francisca would have done what she did for anyone, because, as I've said time and time again, Francisca fights for justice, and she fights to protect. That is why it's no shock to me that she stayed up all night, locked in a freezing cold temple, nonstop in her attempts to undo the trick locks hanging on the inner temple door. And by the way, because this is a video about how much I like Francisca and why, I want to take a brief detour to once again highlight how this woman is built different, how her dedication to what she believes in knows no bounds. Hi, so this is Editing Wendy. Um, since I scripted this video, Nezumi VA made a bunch of Ace Attorney retrospectives, uh, and in her Trials and Tribulations one, she directly referenced the text post that I made that I am also about to reference. So if this part of the video seems a little redundant, that's because, um, we're, we're, we're pulling from the same warehouse. Um, but just to clarify, I, I made the post. I made the post she referenced. And I am now referencing myself. Okay, thank you. Love you. Bye. Okay. So, I did the fucking math, and I can pretty confidently say that over the course of Bridge to the Turnabout, Francisca does not sleep. Now, keep in mind, I'm using the English localization for this. As faulty as it can be, it's kind of all I've got, so think of this within its own bubble. Francisca says that she spent the whole flight reading over the case files, even with Miles chartering a private jet for her with travel time and fuel stops all accounted for, it is still about 12 to 15 hours from Germany to California. Francisca is very punctual and would likely do everything in her power to show up to court on time, but she's late to the trial by a few minutes, which implies that she just barely made it off of her flight in time to show up and prosecute. So she likely did not sleep on the flight over and then went straight to trial, which was at least two hours, but most definitely more. Francisca then stuck around to help investigate that same day three hours later. Her and Phoenix spent the whole rest of the day investigating at Hazakura, and then she went straight from his side to the inner temple to mess with the trick locks. Miles says in-game that she's been out there all night the next morning, and in the anime, he outright says that she hasn't slept and has been awake the whole time. Accounting for time zones, she would have left Germany at about 3 a.m. to get to LA by 10, and she probably needed some time to pack her things, so it's likely Miles called her around 1 or 2, which means she definitely didn't get a full night's sleep beforehand, either. Calculating all of this, along with the trial the next day while she was still working on the locks, and the fact that she was there after the trial, this means that Francisca von Karma was awake for about 43 hours over the course of Bridge to the Turnabout. Probably more. I really, really hope she got a nap after that dinner at Trabian. As I said in the beginning of this section, Francisca's reintroduction to the series begins with her and Miles at trial, with Miles donning Phoenix's badge and trying his damnedest to act as a defense attorney. It is not the details of this trial that matter to me, simply the act of the two of them doing this. Because yes, more than anything, it is simply what needs to be done. But more than that, it's just really really beautiful. Most people understand, without it being explained to them, that this is a very special moment for Miles. Because once upon a time, being a defense attorney was all he wanted from life. It was a dream that had to be discarded, and ultimately it was not the life he ended up living. But I never see people talk about how important it is that it's him and Francisca specifically here in court together. Because the last time an Edgeworth and Yvonne Karma stood opposing counsel, it ended in murder. It ended in a tragedy so deep that it affected every conceivable character in the whole trilogy. In Bridge, though, it's this 
collaboration. It's Smiles Edgeworth calling in a favor from his sister, who is more than delighted to rise to the challenge. It is the presiding judge trying to tone down Francisco's fire, and Miles immediately objecting to the idea. No, no, let my sister crack her whip during trial. That's her stim toy. It's important, and it makes her feel powerful. It's them riffing at one another and working together to figure out the details of this case and to help their friend who is too sick to be there himself. And it's Miles living his childhood dream and getting a chance to see what his life would have been, perhaps, if all that bullshit hadn't happened. But it's also him standing side by side with a person who he only has and loves and gets because it happened. To me, to see the children of DL6 here in court, it feels like a settling. It feels like a storm that's been raging for years has vanished in the sunlight, breaking through the clouds of an overcast that lasted far too long. Despite the tragedy of what happened all those years ago in that elevator, there is something very beautiful hidden within it all. The universe took Miles's father and gave him a sister, and as if to whisper, I'm sorry, the cosmos named his sister Karma. That's the pistol he used to shoot you, isn't it? Yes, I'm thinking of getting it tattooed, maybe taking it home and making rings or some other jewelry out of it. What do you think, Miles? <laughs> uh, I, think, I think I want to be buried with it. That's what I believe, yes. Bury me with a pistol that failed to kill me. <laughs> I kept the bullet say removed from my shoulder as a sort of moment. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> oh, what? I was please. joking! <laughs> I was joking! You don't kill Francisco. <laughs> Francisco kills you. Yeah. At the beginning of this video, I talked about myself in relation to Francisco von Karma. More than anything, I talked about how other people saw so much of us in one another that they couldn't contain it, that they had to tell me. Now I'd like to speak on that and why it means so much to me. This part of the video is not analysis on Francisca's character as much as it is me talking about what she personally means to me. So if you don't feel like listening to my personal musings, feel free to skip ahead, but do know that I can see you skipping and I will be under your bed tonight. So I am autistic if the length and level of microanalysis in this video <laughs> didn't make it abundantly clear. My identity as an autistic person is obviously a crucial part of who I am, but it's also not something I let myself feel particularly alienated about. I'm very lucky to have been blessed with a natural charisma of sorts. Growing up and now, I have always been weird and strange and off-putting, and I got bullied like every other autistic person, but in tandem with that, I had enough love and friendship in my life that it's never really troubled me. I've always been able to internalize the people who other me are the ones in the wrong, not myself for simply being fucking weird. No, I've never felt wrong or bad for being autistic, but I have felt a certain disconnect, not only from a good amount of other autistic people, but also from autistic characters and characters who are coded as autistic. What do I mean by that? Well, I want to say up front that I am not just a woman. My gender is a writhing magenta mass of tentacles some days, and on other days it's got a sword in its hand. I identify as a sort of woman, but the sort of woman who wants to be called they and sir while still being someone's girlfriend and wife. In time, I've just come to say that my gender and sexuality are the same. I'm a butch lesbian in occasional femme drag. Autistic coded women in media. Well, they're lovely because autistic women are lovely. But I only ever seem to see one type of autistic woman. I think two of the immediate examples that jump to mind are Mabel Pines and Lilo Pelikai. You'll notice that they're both young girls, and that's because I really can't find a lot of examples of autistic women in media, only kids. Because people seem to have this idea about autistics that we simply cease to exist after childhood. These girls, of course, are wonderful. They're bright and beautiful and peppy and strange and cute. Their brains are off kilter in all the best possible ways, ways that I'm sure people who think like them can relate to and are delighted to have someone who they can relate to. I love to watch my fellow autistic girls and women see themselves or their younger days in characters like this. Weird little girls who are loud and unapologetic and, most crucially of all, who have people who love them. But that is not me. For me, autism looks like this. I am a savant about the things that my brain latches onto, with such an intimidating intensity that people have said I make having a special interest feel like a competition. When I speak, my enunciation is 
formal, unusual, like I'm reading it aloud to a crowd hanging on my every word, and like I came from a time period different from this modern day. As a child, I often got the in English please from not only kids my age, but adults as well. I am a victim of a very common problem in autistic adults, overwork as a form of self-harm. The idea is when we're younger, we tend to feel kind of useless for all the ways we can't keep up with our peers, but then we grow up, we get a job that is great for the autistic brain, like factory work where you can just sort things all day, or distribution where you can sit in a warehouse and listen to a podcast and just put stuff in boxes without thinking all day. For me, this was retail, electronics and video games to be exact. Organizing shelves and back rooms, info dumping about Nintendo games to curious parents, and most of all, being a phone tech, solving complex problems for people with tangible results. Naturally, we excel at these jobs, and if our workplace is any good, we get praised for that excellence. For the first time in our lives, we're not just good at something, but extraordinary. That praise becomes addictive. The work becomes addictive. The inertia itself becomes addictive. And so we go and go and go and go and do not stop, even when we should. At one point, I had 80 hours of PTO at my work and over 120 hours of unused paid sick time. Autistics do not want to be told that this is a way we slowly kill ourselves, but most of the time, we need to be told. Most of all, though, I'm mean. Well, that's not true. I'm not mean. I know I'm not mean, but here is what I am. I am loud about my boundaries. I am direct with my feelings. I am blunt with people because people deserve to be spoken to in a way that is easy to parse. They do not deserve mind games. I am passionate about what I love. I am fierce in protecting that which is important to me. I am bold and confident, and I love myself, and I love others. And this love is loud. And I do have a short temper because when you are all these things, people think they can paint you as mean. People are jealous. Insecure people do not like to see me living the life I am living. They are upset that they do not personally feel they can be anything like me. They can. And they turn that rage on me, and they call me things like selfish and cold and mean. Some people on my primary social media site of choice at one point decided I am a literal abuser based solely on the tone of voice I use and how they personally internalize it. People have decided I am mean for speaking too much. People have decided I am mean for speaking too little. When I say I I am mean, I am saying it as an act of reclamation. I'm not actually saying I believe I am mean. I'm not declaring to the world that I will step on them. I'm literally taking the words that have been used against me and wearing them as armor. Whatever. Fine. Call me mean for the way I love myself just as fiercely as I love others. If that makes me mean, then I'm fucking mean. Die mad about it. Now, because of this specifically, my identity as an autistic woman crosses over with my identity as a lesbian. I would never feel it more than in this specific regard. Mean lesbians are a staple of the queer community. We are, in essence, a bunch of pissed off dykes who are constantly referred to as mean because when you don't perform for men, the motherfuckers who control everything, how the fuck is anyone else gonna convince you to lay down and perform for them? This also goes for autistic people who refuse to perform for all and all of the weird social cues they made up. I am great at reading social cues, but a lot of the time I just ignore them because I think 95% of them are the stupidest shit in the entire world. We're not mean. We're fucking untethered. We do not have the patience for anything that would disrespect us. That is what it means to be mean. That is why you meet so many mean lesbians. That is why you meet so many mean autistics. We have to learn self-respect from a young age. It's a huge part of what it means to grow up under either of these umbrellas. But if you actually dig a little deeper into this reclamation of meanness and into these mean women, you'll very clearly find that they're hearths just as much as they're wildfires. You would know that they love fiercely and boldly and passionately, and you would know that they'd protect you and fight for you the same way they do for themselves. I'm so sick and fucking tired of people refusing to love mean women all the way through. Like. I'm, I'm just tired of us being here for the queen step on me aesthetic and nothing more. 
None of the men or women who get online and post shit like, oh my god, queen, step on me all day, would ever, ever talk to one of us, let alone choose to love us. I know this from firsthand experience. If you meet a woman who self-identifies as mean, I can guarantee you the fucking world has kicked her and spit on her and turned its goddamn back on her, and she turned into something bright and beautiful anyways. And I can't imagine what kind of fucked up shit for brains would see that and take it for granted and turn their back on her too. But I know firsthand that not everyone feels the same as me. I know that there are just some people who are not going to love us all the way through. In a way, it's kind of hilarious how I did the same thing to Francisca. Because Francisca is the only time I've ever felt truly represented by an autistic coded character. Obviously, I'm sure she was not written to be autistic, but she shares so many of my autistic traits that it's almost hard to list them without feeling like my heart is going to spill over and drown me where it beats in my chest. Francisca is blunt. Literally, it's her name. Her name is a feminine version of Frank, which means blunt. With a special interest like law, it's no wonder that she rose to the top of her class and passed the bar so early. That's just how autistic people are. I love that she's a workaholic. I love that she'll stay up for two days straight on a case or run to court with a fresh bullet wound because even if it isn't healthy, it makes me feel less crazy and alone. And I love that she takes what she wants and chases after what's dear to her. And I love her strong sense of justice and incredible amount of compassion to protect. I love that sometimes she gets so emotional she can't really keep that cool air about her, and I love that everyone thinks she's intense and mean and has her shit together, when in reality she's just kind of a scared little girl. Most of all, I love that she's beautiful. Why are autistic women never allowed to be hot? Why do I never see autistic women who look like me in heels and waistcoats, dolled up in red lipstick, or dressed slutty for a night on the town? Where are the slutty autistics? Besides in my house, ayo. I love that she's obsessively punctual. I love that she doesn't care what anyone thinks about her. And you know what? I've never had a stim toy that changed my life as much as my whip has. No matter what kind of day I'm having, all I have to do is come home and crack that thing for 30 minutes straight. What was I upset about? I don't fucking remember! Sorry, I was stimming. An autistic lawyer is honestly a genius fucking concept. Of course autistic people make great lawyers. Court has rules! Court has scripts. There's a very clear way to do things in court with little variation on the procedure. It plays to the overanalytical autistic mind, building a case and presenting it. And this is most apparent when Francisca and Miles, too, step outside of court. They are social wrecks. They cannot talk to anyone in a way that is even slightly normal. It's like all their competence goes out the window and you're left with these socially stilted weirdos just staring into space and not making eye contact. Court is easy. It's always the same. Small talk is unpredictable, and furthermore, it's unnecessary. I don't want to talk about the weather. I want to talk about how last night I stayed up three hours past my bedtime scripting a 20,000 word YouTube video where I talk at length about some German bitch who isn't real. Every trait Francisca has, I see myself in, and it's so weird to think that once upon a time I refused to. She is difficult, and brutally honest, and rigid, and a perfectionist, and she is competitive, and hot-headed despite her coldness, and arrogant, and stubborn, and all it really amounts to is passion. Francisca cares. She cares so much about so many things. The love I feel is not gentle and slow. When I love something, I feel like every nerve I have is on fire. Like I need to run, like I need to move my hands. It's maddening, really, but it's beautiful to be moved simply because there is so much in the world worth moving toward. I'm Francisca von Karma! Don't fool yourself! You hear me, Miles? I won't walk in your shadow forever! Our fight's just begun! I'm stronger than you! Do you guys want to know something hilarious? Francisca is not my favorite Ace Attorney character. Or my second favorite. Or my third favorite. <laughs> no, Francisca's number four, actually, but I do think she might be the best character in the series. At the very least, in the OG trilogy. 
The balls that it must have taken to write a character like her back in 2002 to introduce this legendary video game villain and then turn around a year later and be like, oh, by the way, his daughter is here now and she's a million times more cool than him. They could have just made her nothing but that. The daughter of Manfred von Karma, nasty and whip-wielding and a thorn in Phoenix's side. They could have made her someone who was indifferent to Miles or viewed him with scorn, this shiny new golden child that her father might have liked more than her. But they didn't. They chose to make Francisca mean and nasty, and they chose to also make her fiercely protective and kind. They chose to make her domineering and competent, and they also chose to peel back the curtain and let us know in little bursts that she's also just a scared young girl, trying not to crumble under the weight of her family name. Sometimes I wonder how different my life would be if I had known that the women in Ace Attorney would end up being some of the best female characters I've ever seen in fiction. To this day, it shocks me that I was just out there, blissfully unaware, thinking it was about these two schmucks making goo-goo eyes at one another across the divide of the courtroom. It's so weird to think that Francisco was just out there, undiscovered, waiting for me. So I think that about wraps it all up. In this video, I've said every conceivable thing I could think to say about why I think Francisca is way more incredible than people give her credit for. I hope that if you're someone who disliked her or felt neutral on her, maybe I could at least make you see things with a little more clarity, or at the very least, think about her a little deeper. I know that a lot of the time when I'm talking about her and really laying things out like this, people say to me that they never really put into perspective her life and her place in the story. So ideally, this video works as a sort of frame of reference to really zoom in and dwell on what might otherwise seem like a depthless character. I think everyone has someone in Ace Attorney who really speaks to their soul, and though she might not be the character I think the most about, she is certainly mine. Here in the end credits, I want to formally thank all the artists who allowed me the use of their art for this video. Chief among them is Cryptid with a Copic Collection, who I really think should be lauded as master of the universe for the amount of art she's drawn me, not only for this project, but just in general. Uh, she's illustrated a lot of my Ace Attorney fanfiction, and everything she made for this video was generously provided without commission, just out of sheer kindness and collaboration. So if I can rally the viewers here to do anything, I would implore you most most of all to go follow her on Tumblr and check her stuff out. There are links to her art and everyone else's in the description. As mentioned in my last video, I don't do YouTube professionally or consistently, but I do occasionally get overcome with the feminine urge to spurg out in long form video formats. If you feel like subscribing, go ahead and hit it and leave this video a comment or a like if you're feeling fun and sexy. I was not expecting my last video to be so well received, especially when the subject matter was so wholly controversial, but everyone was was really fucking nice to me, and that is very motivating. So maybe I'll keep doing this uh, as long as y'all like it. I don't know. Tell me your thoughts. Let me know if I changed yours. I really like reading your comments, and I read literally every single one of them. Like, I read all of them. Uh, feel free to hit me up on Tumblr if you're using it in 2024. Many of my words in this video were actually directly lifted from meta posts that I have written about Ace Attorney over the years, so if you enjoy hearing my thoughts, that is a great way to microdose. Otherwise, I will catch you on the flip side. I don't know how to end videos. Thanks again for watching. Peace. <laughs>